Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. One of my friends who's a neonatologist here at Seattle Children's jokingly asked, why is a surgeon speaking at a conference on autism? Uh, my clinical interest in ASD actually started uh, when I was doing work um, with one of my mentors in Philadelphia, Holly Hedrick, on congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Our group was following the neurodevelopment outcomes of these children and were shocked to find that 7% of our cohort were eventually diagnosed with ASD. And so I've done some work um, in trying to better understand uh, the risk factors of that as well as uh, we've tried to promote different policies in the state of Pennsylvania for early uh, screening and treatment for these children. Um, so I've had an interest uh, in this topic because of that work, but this morning I'd like to present to you a case, a case that uh, uh, became on the national stage uh, due to some controversy, um, and so I hope that we can um, have a good discussion about this. So I'd like to tell you about Cade, a 14-year-old uh, young man with ASD and a phonic tick, or um, what we would, might call Tourette syndrome. Now approximately uh, one out of four or one out of five children with ASD will have some sort of um, uh, behavioral tick. And in Cade's case, um, it was a phonic tick. Um, Cade would scream um, uncontrollably one to 2,000 times a day. Now, Cade lived in Appleton, Wisconsin with his parents, as well as his twin brother, Kyle, who also had ASD. And as you can imagine, uh, this uh, screaming was very problematic for their family. Now, the screams were quite loud, um, recorded up to 90 decibels, so somewhere between uh, the level of a lawnmower and a jackhammer. The family could unfortunately not bring Cade into public. This affected his schooling and basically made it impossible to have any home health care assistance um, because of this. And not to mention his brother Kyle, who I mentioned has ASD as well, was greatly troubled by the noise, which is not uncommon for children with ASD. Now, Cade had been seen by multiple uh, behavioral um, specialists and psychologists. He was on uh, multiple antipsychotics, attempted various behavioral modification therapies, none of which uh, provided any relief. He did find some relief after he underwent Botox injections um, of his larynx. Uh, it was a temporary relief, uh, and unfortunately after a few months it would wear off. And after the fifth injection, there was concern that Cade was actually um, aspirating um, fluids uh, were going into his lungs and he was at risk for developing infections. Now this had been going on in increasing frequency for about three and a half years and it was at this point that the family was referred uh, to Dr. Seth Daly, a surgeon, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon at the University of Wisconsin. Now interestingly, Dr. Daly, who himself has a son with ASD, believed that a surgical procedure might benefit Cade. Um, the theory was that individuals uh, with ASD who engage in these self-stimulating behaviors, such as these tics or head banging or scratching, uh, do so obviously because of a disorder of their sensory processing. And Dr. Daly hypothesized that a surgery that would limit the ability of Cade's vocal cords to adduct or come together would decrease the loudness of his screams and hopefully disrupt this stimulus circulatory uh, response of the screaming. So in 2011, uh, the parents consented to have Cade undergo um, a procedure called a midline lateralization thyroplasty, and this was reported in 2013 in the journal of voice. Now this procedure um, had been done um, multiple times before for other indications, but this was the first time it had ever been performed uh, to relieve a phonic tick. So this procedure, the lateralization thyroplasty, is a reversible surgical procedure in which the surgeon incises the thyroid cartilage, separates it, and then places a, a cartilaginous graft in between uh, that incision. In essence, this widens the, the laryngeal structures. 
So the separated vocal cords um, are separated enough that when an individual would try to scream, um, not enough, uh, they were separated enough that it would just be a breathy scream. In other words, it would decrease the loudness um, of the scream. So Daly published uh, this report um, and the outcomes as well. As you can see initially, um, this reduced uh, Cade screams about 50% and in follow up at six months, almost a 90% reduction in the amount of times he would scream. There's also about a 50% reduction in volume. And in the paper, it reports that Cade was able to return full time to his school. His family uh, began to take him back into public places such as restaurants and the park. And Cade actually, his vocabulary began to develop rapidly um, after this time. In addition, there weren't concerns about uh, his ability to swallow or aspirate um, with the Botox injections. Now his parents were thrilled and viewed this as simply a miracle. Um, his mother stated he couldn't eat, couldn't sleep through the night, he couldn't drink, not to mention work on verbalizing. My boy was suffering, he was tormented. I didn't see him laugh or smile for years. So the family was thrilled for the changes that they saw in Cade, um, as well as what this meant for them as a family and for Cade's brother, Kyle. But not everyone viewed the surgery in such a positive light, and the operation drew harsh criticisms. Some believed that the procedure had been performed merely for the convenience of Cade's parents. People stated that it was analogous to debarking a noisy dog. Furthermore, critics argued that given that Cade did not consent or assent to the procedure, that it violated his human rights and in essence was tantamount to torture. Lydia Brown, who's an autistic writer, advocate, and a law student at Northwestern, wrote in her blog, quote, this is torture to invade someone's body in total violation of their bodily autonomy and perform non-consensual involuntary medical procedures on the whim of another person for what they amount to purely cosmetic purposes. But because Kate is autistic, anything goes, anything is treatment, anything is permissible. If he creates further inconvenience beyond existing, he can be quite literally silenced. Ari Newman, an autism rights activist and the co-founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, responded to the case by writing the following. There's a long history of family members and providers viewing these behaviors as strictly a medical phenomenon and not recognizing they're important for communication. To violate a person's bodily autonomy and damage their ability to communicate to serve the convenience of the caregiver is nothing short of horrific. We view this as similar to the Ashley case or the long history of involuntary sterilization, teeth removal, and other inappropriate and unethical medical procedures conducted against people with developmental disabilities." Unquote. Thus, it was clear that the surgery was deeply symbolic for autism advocates. It represented, in a way, a silencing of a marginalized people who at baseline struggle to have their voice heard. Now, bioethicist Art Kaplan, uh, who was formerly the chair um, of the Department of Medical Ethics at Penn, um, where I spent my last two years, and is now head of medical ethics at NYU, felt differently. He believed the surgery should be celebrated, not condemned. Uh, Dr. Kaplan emphasized the involuntary nature of the screams and the reversibility of the procedures. He wrote, quote, if the behavior was indeed beyond the teenager's control, the more a reversible surgical intervention makes moral sense. And ultimately, Kaplan saw this as benefiting Cade. He writes, if a reversible surgical procedure can help Cade interact with others, stop frightening his brother, better interact with other people, and return sanity to his caregivers, then I say that is a great use of surgery. So what are the most important considerations uh, when we think through the decision to put Cade uh, through this type of surgery? I'll offer a few brief comments uh, right now and then hope that we can uh, potentially unpack them in a little more detail during our Q&A time. So first and most basic is the evaluation of the potential benefit and risks involved with the surgery. And this is something that we routinely uh, counsel parents on with any type of surgery, 
um, however seemingly insignificant or significant it might be. Now the Botox injections that Cade had been receiving did, as I mentioned, provide some temporary relief. However, they were not a good long-term solution and there were serious risks about his ability to swallow and his risk of aspiration. Now the surgery itself, which had been performed um, hundreds, thousands of times for other indications, um, was a relatively safe procedure, had very minimal risks. And it seems in, um, anecdotally that the surgery has allowed Cade to live a richer, more fuller life. But beyond the benefits to Cade himself, should the interests of his family, his parents, his brother Kyle, be taken into account? And this gets a little trickier. Traditional bioethics um, has a liberal view of persons. And what I mean by that is they understand a person as a free, rational, self-determining, autonomous being. And perhaps this is why, in bioethics generally, uh, children are so under-theorized. I believe this view, this emphasis, fails to account for our connectedness, our deep, intimate, dependent relationships with others. And the web of connection to others can be seen in countless adult and pediatric um, examples. For example, taking care of a parent with Alzheimer's or a child with cancer. How to best manage respective values, desires, and best interest is not an easy task. I believe in patient-centered care, but a patient-centered care that understands that particular patient as a member of a family and a community and therefore takes family goals seriously. So the fact that Cade's surgery also benefited his parents and his brother is ultimately not problematic in my mind. Whose decision was it to make? In this case, I believe it was, in fact, the parent's decision to make. Now, the topic of adolescent medical decision-making and mature minor legislation is very important and very contentious. But even if one believes that, chil that children should have decision-making authority when there is a parent-child disagreement, it's not clear to me that Cade was able to appreciate the situation or the proposed procedure, that he was able to understand the facts relevant to a choice, or that he even possessed the ability to communicate a choice. But uh, clearly the sort of capacity will vary from adolescent to adolescent with ASD, and I would caution against generalizing from this. Finally, it's important to ask what implications this case may have on others with ASD. Tragically, there has been abuse of people with cognitive disabilities by those in medicine over much of the 20th century. And it's understandable to see the outrage over a procedure that affects a boy's vocal cords. It is perceived as a literal silencing of a people who have fought so hard to have their voice heard. And so this case must be discussed with great empathy and compassion. But as Dr. Daly himself has stated, the story is one that is extremely easy to misunderstand. And I believe that instead of silencing Cade, I believe the surgery has actually augmented his voice and allowed his family to continue to provide loving care to both Cade and his brother Kyle. I imagine that the surgery uh, will be offered to more individuals in the future um, who have similar struggles. Uh, but it will be important to evaluate this on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to discussing this with you.